what influences what system a beef farmer uh, chooses for his farmer? What should influence his choice of system? Yeah, so I suppose what should influence it is, you know, the resources that are available to that farmer. So be it land resources, labour resources, the time that you have available, and also the skill of your, your labour, and I suppose the type of work that you enjoy. You know, some farmers, you know, may have uh, very, very good calf rearing skills, and other farmers may not have time to be rearing calves artificially, so they may opt to buy in calves weaned. Um, and also, we, we, we have to look, as well as the labour, we, we have to look at the facilities available on the farm. You know, is there housing facilities there? And, and if they're not there, that'll, you know, probably mean that you need to go to an early maturing system where you try and avoid and, you know, fully utilise your shed space available so on the farm. second winter, maybe. Exactly. Um, but I suppose some of the common factors that we see across the most profitable systems uh, are the use of graze grass. So we know that the systems that can utilize large quantities of graze grass, probably in excess of 80% of the animal's total lifetime feed requirement coming from graze grass, and those that can achieve an early age of slaughter from, from that type of system are the most profitable. And over the years, you know, we've probably seen that you know, your heifer systems killing at 19, 20 months, avoiding that second winter, and carrying more animals per hectare, those systems have performed very, very favorably because they're able to produce high carcass output from a predominantly grass-based diet. And also, I suppose, uh, there's a lot of other factors that will promote and help uh, the implementation of dairy beef systems, and they're market and consumer factors. And we can see that dairy beef, you know, is a really good opportunity to produce a carcass on spec, you know, 280 to 320 kilos, which is very much in demand. A lot of the breeds that are used heavily on the dairy herd, you know, we know that there is, uh, you know, that they are market, uh, marketed and targeted towards high value specialist markets. Um, so, and we can also achieve, you know, the desirable uh, fatness on the carcass quite easily. And, the, you know, we probably do have, a, you know, very suitable animal for a, a pasture based uh, beef production system. Yeah. Just on that, Nikki, what level is the performance? You're, you, you've already slaughtered the first cattle from your dairy calf to beef trial here in Grange. What levels of performance are you achieving uh, over those first and second summers at grass? Yeah, so from the dairy beef uh, study in Grange, we've one complete cycle of cattle killed. So some of those were, uh, you know, high EBI Holstein Frisian animals, and we had two different uh, Angus genotype groups. And, you know, it was a very intensive grass based system. To the Holstein Frisians, we only fed 740 kilograms of concentrate in their entire lifetime from birth right through to slaughter and we're 100 kilos behind that for our early maturing Angus uh, animals. So we achieved uh, a 23 month age at slaughter for our Holstein Frisians and 22 months for our okay. early maturing Angus. So, you know, those anim animals to achieve those early age at slaughter, they obviously achieved yeah. high levels of performance over the, those over grazing those seasons. Grazing periods. So we need to be hitting, you know, about 0.8 of a day during the first grazing season. We need to be still growing the animal over the winter period, you know, from a, a high quality grass silage diet, achieving, you know, probably a 0.7 of, of a day we achieved. And then over the second grazing season, this is really where you, you need to economise and, and probably where we see us making our biggest gains and we're achieving 0.9 to a kilo a day on those animals. Okay. And because of that high grassland performance that we achieved and performance at grass, we saw that we only need to feed our animals for 60 days on an intensive uh, concentrate diet indoors for our Aberdeen Angus and 80 days for our Holstein Frisians. Yeah. You mentioned high genetic and low genetic merit groups there, so th that was on, on, the, on the carcass indexes and things like that. Did you see a difference between the high index and the low index animals in that first group of animals that were killed? Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose what the difference that we saw between the two Angus groups, it was non-significant, the difference that we, we detected after one year's uh, gathering of data. However, you know, the, the experiment is only half powered at the moment and that will be completed with the second year's uh, slaughterings. And we saw that uh, we had a seven kilo difference between our high carcass merit Aberdeen Angus versus our low carcass merit Aberdeen Angus. But where we did see significant differences was in the value of each of those kilos, the confirmation of those carcasses that drove the value and the kill out percentage of those animals. And you know, so we achieved a higher value carcass from our higher mix animal after the same finishing period and at the same age of slaughter. So really, 
And one of the things is that the genetic differences between the two Angus groups were quite small. And it's probably going to be much greater when we go back to the DBI and look at that wide array of breeds of bulls that we have, you know, that there's much bigger differences between them there. And, you know, I think on a bigger scale, you know, there, there is big gains to be achieved.